for the fantastic venue of today. Uh, I was asked, asked by our organizers to introduce the case study session and recent work carried out by French Israeli team in the field of Crusader archaeology. Before that, I'd like to share with you a few thoughts on French contributions in the field going back to the early days of, the, of medieval archaeology in the Levant. A few years ago, as I was starting my PhD here in Jerusalem, I was very fortunate to be, oh, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I was very fortunate to be invited uh, to present the first step of my research in a two-day workshop organized by the Israeli Academy of Science in honor of Professor Dennis Pringle in Acre. So the workshop ideally took place in Acre, the last capital city of the Crusader Kingdom, some of you visited two days ago. And um, during the, his uh, introductory speech, Professor Pringle shared his view on what he thinks was distinctive of French and British archaeological approaches of Crusader sites. I was already interested in the matter, and I kept in mind the idea of exploring the question further. Today's gathering of eminent archaeologists and medievalists from both countries in Jerusalem offered a good opportunity to present a survey of the French production. Perhaps addressing the question of French contribution to Crusader archaeology requires a short introduction. The terminology itself, uh, although it is the most widely employed by archaeologists, clearly poses an epistemologic issue in terms of definition and periodization. Strictly speaking, Crusader archaeology should only refer to the material aspects of the Crusaders themselves, that is, Latin Christians taking part uh, in the crusading movement. Instead, the current understanding of the expression encompasses all aspects of life during the period of the Crusades, that is, almost two centuries including non-Latin communities in contact with the Crusaders, such as Jews, Oriental Christians, and Muslims, as well as Latin settlers and Pulani, who, stricto sensu, should not be considered as Crusader anymore. Um, so, moreover, quite recently, Crusader archaeology was also applied to new areas of investigation far beyond the Mediterranean and for later periods for instance, in relation, in relation with the Baltic um, region in the 14th century. Roni Annenblum and many archaeologists working in the neighboring region have criticized the use of the expression as Europocentric because it places the focus on the Crusades, a historical phenomenon heavily mobilized by nationalist and colonialist discourses up to this day. Indeed, the expression often appears unadapted for, let's say, the material culture shared on a regional scale. According to the same logic, it seems problematic to use the adjective crusader to define a period instead of a more general expression, um, like Middle Islamic period, as suggested by Donald Withcombe, or given centuries which are less subjective and more inclusive in regard to the regional history. Therefore, going back to my survey of French contribution, I decided not to limit myself to Israel and to the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and to restrict the scope of Crusader archaeology to the 12th and 13th century, including areas which were interacting with the Latin East without being under Frankish control. Then what may be considered a French contribution? Due to the increasing number of international collaboration, I limited my survey to the state-supported um, archaeological projects, all those of achievements like the excavation of uh, Safed, for example, by our good friend and colleagues, uh, Hervé Barbet, could be considered as a French contribution by a true colonial Frenchman. <laughs> and Hervé Barbet is working for the Israeli Antiquities Authority. <laughs> so he has a foot in, in both places. Um, as we have seen yesterday, one can consider the French contribution to Crusader archaeology started even before the birth of modern archaeology. In the first half of the 19th century, and those names will sound familiar, many colleagues uh, mentioned them yesterday, several French scholars contributed, several French scholars <laughs> contributed to uh, the exploration of Palestine and therefore to our knowledge of Crusader heritage. Important figures such as Louis-Félicien de Saucy, 
or Victor Guérin, were primarily concerned with historical topography, but with this curiosity so typical of the 19th century, they also described carefully some crusader sites. For the historical context and the Frankish toponymy, they heavily relied on the influential studies of Joseph-François Michaud, the great French historian of the Crusades. Guérin and de Saucy were followed by another generation of scholars who specialized in various subfields, producing major works on, on churches, castles, <coughs> numismatic and sigillography, while pursuing the research on historical geography. Within this generation, for which, as you can see, the, the moustache was a, a mandatory attribute, um, Alban Emmanuel Guillaume Ray conducted a pioneer study of Crusader castles. In his books and essays, published between 1860s and 1880s, he described quite thoroughly the remain of most of the major fortresses and towers in Greater Syria, producing reference plans and sections, as well as general maps of many larger urban sites. Ray's works, which also dealt with historical documents and combined geography and monumental data, soon became a model for the researchers as well and, and had also a major impact on his countrymen. Around the same year, Charles de Vauguet and Gustave Schlumberger collected and studied coins and seals in the Near East. They published numerous articles and catalogued some of which, uh, like the posthumous volume of the, on the seals of the Latin East, published by Adrien Blanchet in 1943, are still considered as reference guide um, nowadays. Their personal collection constituted the bulk of crusader numismatic and sigillographic collections of the Cabinet de Médailles in the French uh, National Library. Um, so you can see that's part of this uh, collection, uh, coins from the Latin East, two days in, in Paris. And you can see that the inventory numbers are, are still those actually of, uh, of Schumberge. I don't know if you can see. Here you have Boguet and Schumberge. And it was never inventoried. I mean, recently inventoried. Um, set apart the relatively recent studies of Hans Eberhard Meyer on the royal seals of Jerusalem and the articles on recent finds published by our uh, national Robert, um, the sea geography of the Latin East is a field almost abandoned by a recent scholarship, and it would deserve a new synthesis in the light of recent methodology. Besides Seals and Led Boulet, um, Schlumberger and Clermont Gano also acquires, acquired a number of enameled sword dagger pommels, which for some of them reach French museum, like the Cluny Museum in Paris. As these interesting artifacts, which are present in collection, uh, not only in France, but also in, in the US, in the Metropolitan Museum of New York, or here even in, in Jerusalem, are attracting new attention. And Rafi Lewis, I know, uh, is uh, currently publishing some of them. So in the first half of the 20th century, Camille Enlard and Paul Deschamps published two master studies on the churches and castles of the Latin East. It is not worthy that all those researchers belong to a common network. First, there was some kind of di direct violation and also interperson strong interpersonal connections. René Dussault, the author of the famous Topographie de la Syrie Antique et Medievale, considered Clermont Gano as his master. And in 1927, Camille Enlard, who saw himself as a student of de Vauguet, wrote to Paul Deschamps saying that he didn't uh, feel able to return to Syria and that he, uh, he interested Deschamps to study military architecture. Second, in the center of this network were also a number of institutions which played a major role in financing and supporting logistically the expedition and publication of the scholars. Um, some were also influential on an ideological level. Um, most of them actually, uh, except two, uh, belong to the Oeuvre d'Orient, so uh, this uh, charitable uh, organization who was actually supporting the, um, the Oriental Christian in the name of the, of, uh, of, uh, the French government. Um, most of them also belong to, to academic societies, such as the Société Géographique, where they met and exchanges in Paris. The most preeminent one, the most preeminent institution, was obviously the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, which had already a long history um, with crusader history and research, 
since the publication of the Recueil des Historiens des Croisades. Other institutions, like the Louvre and the Musée des Sculptures Comparées in the Trocadero, also supported expedition, hoping to benefit from the discoveries. Eventually, major institutions like Collège de France and also the École des Chartres and École des Langues Orientales did also support these early researches and participated to the professionalization of the field. French researchers on the Crusades could also rely, uh, as we do today, uh, on permanent institutions in the East. One of them was the École Biblique of, uh, of Jerusalem. So here, just a short uh, list of those institutions and permanent institutions in the East. So they were located uh, not only in Palestine, but uh, in Syria, in Lebanon, and uh, of course in, uh, in Egypt. So the Ecole Biblique, many of you know probably, uh, close to the old city, outside the wall, um, hosted uh, two major, well, three major scholars, actually, uh, who played a role in, uh, in Crusader archaeology. Uh, the first two, um, Félix Marie Abel and Louis Hugues Vincent, who are the major authors of the topography and history of, uh, of Palestine. And um, the third one, Roland de Vaux, uh, also uh, carried out the excavations. So, for example, this, to my opinion, exemplary um, excavation for, for the time, 1932. So at the same time, Cedric Norman Jones is starting his work in Atlit and two uh, Dominicans uh, excavated the site of uh, Amwas. And maybe Andreas Hartmann can uh, <laughs> tell us about the quality of the relief for the, for the period. And um, another excavation, always by, still by a uh, Dominican, uh, Roland de Vaux, <coughs> took place in Abu Ghosh and was amongst the first to bear really interest and to publish the, the, the pottery. Um, what is interesting, and you, you will see this also later, is that French scholarship was far behind, uh, I have to say, the, the British one in terms of, uh, of uh, involvement into the study of, uh, of uh, Crusader and, let's say, Middle Medieval pottery. But it was not true for the Islamic context, and we can mention only two major figures. Gaston Viette and Jean Sauvaget, who worked in Syria and in Egypt, which are most, mostly known actually for their historical and uh, Arabic editions, but who also bear an interest in, in the pottery, and, uh, and actually they started uh, museums and, and they asked for a new study of the Islamic, the first studies of Islamic pottery in their respective country. Um, with the establishment of the French mandate on Syria in 1923, they, there were a lot of activities and, and, and French scholars were actually at the forefront of um, aerial photography at this time. They were led by this uh, Jesuit uh, in adventurer, Antoine Poitbar, who is seen here flying, I'm not sure of the if it's a British or a French uh, aircraft, but uh, the photo is taken by uh, a French aircraft in Syria. And later on, some uh, major archeologists like Paul Deschamps will use also this uh, military aircraft to cover actually and survey a um, large part of Syria and to take this fantastic picture of, uh, of castles. And we will see that Actually, French contributions uh, was mostly directed to two main objects, churches and castles. And starting to change, but uh, slowly, slowly. And actually, French publication accounted the numbers of monographs, which are uh, very important, but no synthesis. Like we have a synthesis on a, a major sum on, uh, on the churches. We have a major sum on the on the castles, but there is no global picture in there. And you may be surprised to learn that uh, Cedric Norman Jones was still young at the time, um, had this idea, actually he started to write uh, a sum on crusader archeology, span much even before Adrian Boas, who's 
so still <laughs> still the only one uh, I think uh, today. And I found this letter in a, in a box we were um, going through to inventory the legacy of Jones in the IAA, and it's a personal letter uh, written on the on the last day of the year 1935 the very last day, from Atlit, he's still in the castle on the 31 of December, and he's uh, writing to Arnold Walter Lawrence, who is the brother of T.E. Lawrence, who himself did his PhD on, on the Crusader castles. And if you look at the date, it's eight months, exactly eight months after the death uh, in a dramatic accident uh, of uh, T.E. Lawrence. And in this letter, he mentions his project and he says, it's on the way. I'm re writing this sum of um, crusader archaeology, looking at pottery, looking at uh, architecture, civil architecture, um, religious architecture, and so on. And he's also mentioning, for those who are interested, um, uh, several scholars which are only starting their, their uh, work, like uh, Smail. Actually, he misspelled the name Smail in the, in the letter. Yeah, OK. So I say that the British mandate uh, gave opportunity for the French to, to excavate, and I think this is also something quite typical, but the, um, they actually relied heavily on, on um, army forces to clear the crack, for example, but also to, to visit uh, Banyas. Here you can see a picture of Deschamps on his horse going through the uh, gate tower of, uh, of Banyas. And uh, it is also like, it was thought as a, um, as a national project, really. Here you can see um, a monument to the memory of the veterans of the Levant army, and it depicts the crusader, clearly. So they were also uh, thinking themselves as crusaders. Um, or maybe ideological bias, just to, to say. So that's the same site. Um, Actually, that's a castle overlooking the site of Banyas, and you well know that uh, Deschamps published it at the, as a Crusader castle because it was fine, it was fine work, it was uh, uh, brilliant, he studied it, so it was a Crusader, so it was Frankish, so it was French, that's, that's uh, logic. And in fact, uh, new studies uh, have proved that, uh, as we actually could even imagine from the text, that uh, it's an Ayubid castle, it started in the first quarter of the 13th century, from the Ayubid Lord of uh, Emir of, um, of Banyas, and that there's no, nothing crusader in it. Uh, a short survey of uh, PhDs, I'm not sure you can read it, but uh, um, supported, defended in France in, during the last uh, 30 years, or 20 years, um, related to crusader archaeology, sometimes directly, sometimes a bit more yeah, perfectly, and you can see that, or you can't see that, um, <laughs> most of them are still dealing with crusades, with castles and churches, and only few are dealing with the um, landscape or material culture. Uh, we had, I think, she was the first; she was the pioneer. Um, uh, we had uh, Brigitte Poré, who published, uh, well, supported the uh, um, PhD on uh, pottery but then she just disappeared from the field and uh, it's hard to find it even. So um, since 30 years, uh, French excavation on Crusader sites have been carried all around the Eastern Mediterranean uh, from the castle of uh, Talbashir in, uh, in Turkey, Turbesel, till the Ayubid wall of uh, city wall of Cairo, and of course in Jordan, Syria, and Palestine. But as you can see, what is published is again mostly about uh, crusader, well, military architecture in general. A uh, few studies are devoted to, um, to material culture and, uh, and landscape and territorial studies. And that's really, I think, what we should uh, look forward, like look beyond the wall now, are the last two mission uh, of uh, two expedition of uh, French expedition in Israel were on Caesarea, on the fortification, and also on a castle, on Belvoir Castle. And um, what we tend to do now is to also study this site in its larger context, and, and especially how it, uh, it works with the territory and hinterland. 
So, and that's also what we are doing now in, uh, in athletes, and we plan survey of the surroundings to better understand the, the mobility and the, the um, relationship with the, with the internal and with the villages. So that will be whole. And this is, uh, I think, a great uh, picture from the collection in the Ecole Biblique, where you see the Dominican, the, that's the tense of the Dominican, in front of Banyas. On top of the, of the spur is the castle of Subebe. And of course, you have a French flag on, uh, on the tent. Thank you very much.